Hello everyone, my name is Anne Lord and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's AWRI webinar. Today's session will look at the results from a three-year study looking at block level yield estimation. Joining me to discuss these results is one of the project's collaborators, Dr. Mark Whitty from UNSW. Mark Quitty is a lecturer at UNSW Sydney and leads the Smart Robotic Viticulture Research Group. This group has been responsible for developing methods for image processing in viticulture, including shoot detection, flower counting, berry counting, yield estimation and apps for wine, water stress detection. For those in the audience, I invite you to join in the conversation and ask questions. To ask a question, please open the Q&A session of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. If you would like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those of you just joining us, welcome. Today's topic is improved yield estimation for the Australian wine industry. And I'll hand over now to our speaker, Dr. Mark Whitty, to start the conversation. Hear about some of our results in yield estimation. I know some of you have seen some of our previous results and are looking forward to see what we have to talk about today. So uh, let's get started. But first of all, uh, a little bit of introduction to the uh, project. This has been a three year study funded by Wine Australia through the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. We've worked closely with Treasury Wine Estates in the Clare Valley and seesaw wines at Orange to work on a couple of study blocks in each location. So the group that's worked on this is quite extensive um, and based at UNSW primarily for the uh, research aspects uh, with many team members and a number of ongoing projects uh, with industry both in viticulture and in robotics and automation. So just to lay the context for why this project came about uh, a GAPS analysis by Wine Australia some years ago found that the accuracy of yield estimation varied significantly. And as most of you will be very well aware, yields vary dramatically from year to year. So you can see in the uh, graph on screen that over the last 15 or so years, uh, for the four study blocks that we have, there is great variation from year to year, uh, not only depending on site, but also on variety as well. Now, why does that matter? In terms of achieving accuracy, winemakers would like to have an accuracy of around 5% error in terms of how much fruit, the volume of fruit that turns up at the winery itself. Now that's an ideal case, but that was the target we would set for this project to see how close we could get to 5% error and as early in the season as possible. Now, previous work by the project manager, Greg Dunn, showed that best practice manual yield estimation achieved around 15% error after fruit set. He also looked at some early work on image processing in vines to try and detect the amount of fruit on the vines. Since then, a substantial amount of work by Steve Nusky's group in the US at Carnegie Mellon University has developed algorithms for counting bunches and berries in vines, and they claim to be able to estimate yield to within 9.8% accuracy using image processing post veraison So we'll see how that stacks up against uh, results uh, in the Australian industry. So first of all, some four study blocks, as I mentioned, we've done the study across Two varieties, two Shiraz and two Chardonnay, one at each location of Clare and Orange. 
These are medium scale blocks. Um, notably, all of them are spur pruned. The two at Clare were uh, Aussie sprawl, so vines extending everywhere, whereas the two in orange were more strictly trained in a VSP system. Otherwise, they're not particularly notable blocks and designed to be representative of the Australian uh, wine industry. So for many of you out there that have done yield estimation, you'll be quite aware that it's a tedious process. And some of you may have used the DNRE workbook, uh, which suggests using 60 centimeter wide segments. And you can see a frame set up there in the vineyard, 60 centimeters wide, in which we could count objects, whether they be bunches or inflorescences, and use a number of those samples around the block to interpolate up to the entire block to understand how much fruit is there on the vines or how much fruit potential is there at each particular time through the season. And using some long-term averages, the intention then would be to use the, uh, for example, the average bunch weight or the average berry weight to predict the overall yield for the block. And if you've done that, you'll know that doing it by hand takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And some of you may have done berry counting, as you can see in the images on the right, this is exceptionally tedious. Some of you may have even tried flower counting, even worse. And I hope never to have, never ever to have to count flowers or berries again. But never fear, we have some solutions to show you. But you're very well aware that it's a, a challenging problem. So how can we automate that and make things easier and quicker for the farmers? So the next slide, I'm going to show you some very raw results. And these are across the three years. So each column is one year of the project where we've used best practice manual yield estimations at four different stages. So the four stages are given by the four red circles in each of the figures plotted over time. And on the vertical axis is the tonnage or the predicted tonnage for that season. So the blue line indicates what the final harvest tonnage in each individual block was. And the red points are what we estimated at the four stages, which were the shoot stage, immediately prior to flowering, which I'll refer to as flowering, pea size to veraison, depending on which year, and finally, immediately prior to harvest. Now, if you just have a look at these dots overall, it's very difficult to identify any particular trend. In any one block, the uh, estimate will, can be an over or an underestimate in any given year. If you just look at particular times, so whether it be particular maturity stages, so from shoot stage or the flowering stage, it's not always an under or an overestimate. With one exception being the pea-sized or veraison estimate. In this case, the majority of estimates are overestimates. And we're going to put that down to the fact that at these stages, the estimate is based around berry counting. And the selection of bunches in order to do the berry counting is very critical. And we believe that that introduces substantial bias into the accuracy of the results, up to 100% and more error. So this is what you get if you do a state-of-the-art manual yield estimation. So to put some numbers on that, let's just see how that turns out in terms of accuracy. Looking at the shoot stage, and I know that not a lot of farmers do estimates at the shoot stage, but we're using a simple count of shoots and then extrapolating up to the block. The average error in yield estimation, that's predicted yield versus what actually turns up at the winery, allowing for bins that go missing, allowing for harvester efficiency, allowing for uh, any other kinds of fruit loss, allowing for weather effects. The average error there is around 29%, which is clearly too high for what the farmers would like. Now you would kind of expect that error to decrease looking at the average column on the right hand side. You would expect that to decrease as we get closer to harvest. And with the exception of the pea-sized and pre veraison measurements, it does. But the key thing I want you to take away from this slide is that delivered tonnage of fruit at harvest is quite different 
from the best manual estimates even at harvest. All of those red numbers. And what it shows that if we have a manual estimate, on average, even measuring the fruit on the vine a day or within a couple of days prior to harvest, the manual estimates are still out on average by 15%. That's quite sobering when we think of it, that the winemakers would like 5% a few months earlier, but actually when it comes close to harvest, 15% is where it's at for manual yield estimation. The number of samples here, I should note for all of these has been in year one and two, uh, you might see PY1 and PY2 occasionally, was 26 samples per hectare. Um, suggested by some of Rob Bramley's earlier work. So what, what that turns out to be in the first two rows of this second table here is that for PY1 and PY2, the number of samples is several hundred per block. And that's a lot of work. And for farmers that want an accurate estimate, that's really too much work when you're only getting an error, or you're still getting an error of 15%. So we've got to think about how we can reduce that amount of sampling. But secondly, one of the things we undertook to study was how does the amount of sampling affect the results? And we specifically chose to investigate stratified sampling in year three. So the third year of the project, we took a yield map from a yield monitor from year two at harvest stage we divided that yield map into three regions of low, medium, and high yield, or effectively stratified it. And in each, we selected randomly 10 locations in each of the low, medium, and high yielding regions, and distributed the samples for the following year, year three, according to that yield map at the end of year two season. And what it shows here is that if you stratify the sampling, in the third year of the table, you can see that the average error is slightly better, but certainly on par with a much larger number of unstratified, randomly located samples. So stratified sampling does work. Nextly, to look at what happens in the block and some of the effects on final yield, I'm showing here some work by one of my PhD students, Julie Tang, who used aerial imagery from either manned vehicles, manned, manned vehicles or UAVs to fly over the blocks and take imagery from the air and then process it to detect areas of non-bearing or missing, non-bearing cordon or missing vines. And the, the proportion of non-bearing cordon was substantial. Um, three, in one case, 18%. Although I do note in the following year that was improved dramatically by manual intervention and down to around 6%. Why does this matter and why do we need this? Simply, if you don't have a good idea in your block of how many vines are missing or where non-bearing area is, that 6% will immediately impact your overall yield estimate because you're not getting fruit from those vines. So we needed to take that into account when we were doing the estimates. The next thing we needed to take into account was harvester efficiency. And although Dan and Martin have provided a number of guides for harvester efficiency, we thought, let's check out what's happening on the ground. So we went out and tediously measured fruit dropped off the vines onto the ground by the harvester uh, for each of the four blocks. And you'll see that the harvester efficiency ranged from 84% up to 96%. And it depended on how careful the drivers were. It depended on whether it was a pull behind or a self-propelled harvester. But those were the values we found in year two, and we used them uh, for our analysis of this project. Most of the fruit that was lost was fruit that dropped onto the ground rather than fruit uh, remaining on the vine. So finding ways to improve the harvesters to capture that fruit seems to be a no-brainer for improving the overall volume of fruit that you collect. So getting now into our project and our yield estimation by image processing. In the first year of the project, we trialed a system using GoPro videos, mounted these GoPro cameras onto a couple of vehicles. So 
On the left, you can see a strange looking contraption mounted on a ute. The GoPro camera is circled in red. Uh, and this one's anecdotally called the DeLorean because of the uh, winged shape. But the idea was that the camera would be mounted on the vehicle and the backing boards would be mounted over the rows in order to provide a clear background as we drove through the block. Now I can hear you all saying that looks very, very impractical and who'd want to drive a vehicle around like that? Well, the answer is nobody. And when we came to the later year of the project, the solution was found that was able to work without using the backing boards. So why did we do this and move around the block? Within the project, we found a method for taking the video of the vines using the GoPros and turning that into either stitched or unstitched imagery and developing that into a continuous path throughout the block, driving as a tractor would for spraying, for example. But without using GPS, we were able to turn that into a map of shoot variation or shoot density variation throughout the block, as you can see on the right hand side. This, as well as what comes next, which were a particular feature of work done by one of my then PhD students, Scarlett Liu, who also continued to work on the project as a postdoc, she developed some very novel algorithms to independently count the shoots in each of these images. And these are done by unsupervised clustering and unsupervised learning. So they don't require any manual intervention to count them, as opposed to many prior image processing methods. One of the advantages of this is the robustness to different conditions. Here you can see an animation of what happens when you have cloudy conditions. The next frame will show you what happens when you have sunny conditions with the same algorithm running in both. And as you can clearly see, the detection of shoots there is accurate without using backing boards and was absolutely integral to the success of this project and the final year results, which I'll show in a moment. How did that turn out in terms of accuracy? You can see as the project progressed, the accuracy improved down the left hand column. And this was measured by counting the exact number of shoots within a two panel segment at 20 locations throughout the block and comparing that with what was detected in the video. So the accuracy of the shoot counting is now up close to 90%. The accuracy then of the final yield estimation has also been improving. And you can see that in the middle column. And so the accuracy in the final year using shoot counting of the final yield, predicting forward for a ratio of bunches to shoots, predicting forward for a, an average bunch weight, and including the other factors like harvester efficiency, we get an accuracy or an error of around 20%, accuracy of 80% for the shoot stage. If you compare that with a very naive manual counting, we can see that we're improving on that to a small extent and even greater uh, in year two. So this shoot counting has been shown to improve over manual yield estimation without requiring any tedious field work. But the bonus that comes by doing this in an automatic manner is the mapping that it provides. So on the left hand side, you will see a very detailed map that was generated by Scarlett using the shoot counts from the GoPro video. And this map was generated five months prior to harvest. And it gives you a very clear idea of where in the block there are a lot more or less density of shoots. Why does this matter? We found in one block that there was a certain target of let's say 30 shoots per vine or per meter, depending on which block you're running in. And when you actually go through and count what was there after hand pruning, the t what was actually there was a range between 10 and 120. So hand pruning is very inaccurate in terms of the number, which means that you don't actually know how many shoots are there, even if you have a target. So being able to count these shoots and see within the block where there's a greater or less density is really, really useful because you can go out and perhaps improve the shoots. It gives you information on where you might uh, do some kind of thinning, whether it be bunch thinning or whether it be leaf plucking. It gives you information on where you may be able to differentially water the vines 
or apply mulch in particular in a differential manner in order to make a more uniform yield so that you can also try and improve the quality of the grapes that you generate. You can see this as a direct comparison with the harvester yield map on the right hand side. The general pattern of density of shoots throughout the block reflected the pattern of the final volume of fruit throughout the block. That wasn't the case in all of the blocks, but we're certain that this tool provides you, the growers, with the ability to differentiate between low, medium and high shoot densities to improve the management actions going on. That was one of the major outcomes from this project and from in year one in particular. In year two, we went on to extend this, aiming to go for a more, a more advanced camera setup. In year one, the GoPros we used did not prove successful in detecting and counting the bunches or the inflorescences on the vine. And in fact, the inflorescences proved impossible to detect during any of our project years while driving past. So in year two, the intention was to use a better, more expensive and higher quality camera setup as well as a lighting rig and a flash setup, as you can see in this image. The quality of the images varied, as you can see here as a comparison on the left hand side, a GoPro image with the same row and the same vine from what we call a Manta camera, which we used in year two. Clearly the Manta camera improved the result, improved the accuracy of, uh, sorry, improved the image quality. However, the usability of this expensive system was absolutely hopeless. It took six months of trials and tribulations to finally get the camera to work. And so for us as a technical team dealing with it in the field, it was almost impossible. For the end user, just imagine that would be even worse. So in order to not waste all of the time in year two, we tried to develop some more methods for doing the bunch detection from the GoPro imagery. Having ruled out that the Manta and the more advanced camera was not going to prove useful, not only for the volume of data collected, but usability, we looked at what we could do with the GoPro imagery. And one of my students, Philip Van Kerkel, looked at applying some convolutional neural network approaches to the bunch detection. And you can see a couple of results in the bottom images. This, despite being a more advanced technique, did not prove to be reliable in detecting the bunches, predominantly because of the enormous amount of uh, blur in the images, varying lighting conditions in the GoPro cameras, as well as the fact that a vast majority of the bunches are hidden. So occlusion factors are very high and very variable within these bunches. Within year two, we also looked at buried diameter and mass measurement. So here's an image of a single bunch that was taken off, marked, and the berry diameters measured carefully and the berry masses weighed. And we were able to develop some algorithms, both through Scarlett and another undergraduate student, Stephen Liu, who was able to develop, detect the diameter of the berries on the bunches to a 5% error or 95% accuracy. You can see that applying this in the field would then be great in order for farmers to understand the diameter of their berries, not as also as a yield prediction, but also for influencing berry and bunch quality. So finally, I'll come to year three and the yield estimation method that we've applied and has proven to be most useful and we'd love to continue and extend this work. So here we've taken four different stages of maturity. First of all, we've gone through and used Scarlett's video GoPro shoot detection to map out and count the number of shoots across the entire block. Secondly, within this project, we've developed a flower counting algorithm that's able to accurately sense the number of flowers on a single inflorescence from a single photo taken by mobile phone, whether on the vine or in the lab. And we'll look at the accuracy of that a little bit later. Also within the project, we developed an algorithm for counting the number of berries at pea size. And we also made use of another of Scarlett's inventions, the 3D bunch reconstruction work, which you may have also seen elsewhere, 
which is an algorithm for counting the number of berries on a bunch and detecting the sparsity, predominantly closer to harvest, but also works earlier on in the season. The major advantage of the final algorithm is that it does not require training or calibration with existing bunches. It works purely on a geometrical basis. Having taken data at these four stages, we can then relate what we have back to a shoot basis. So in year three, we took the videos across the entire blocks. At the flowering, pea-sized and harvest stages, we labeled three or all, rather all inflorescences on three shoots within at 30 different stratified sample locations within the block. The objective of this was to get a count of the number of flowers per shoot and then measure that non-destructively and again measure it at pea-sized and again measure the number of berries at pea-sized and harvest in order to get a number of berries per shoot. If we know the number of berries per shoot, we understood that the berry mass would tend to be consistent from year to year. Now that didn't always prove to be true, as we'll note. But if it was consistent, then the berries per shoot and knowing the number of shoots across the entire block should give us a good estimate of the entire mass of berries in the block and hence the yield. What can we see from the results we have here? At the bottom, we've plotted out the variation of shoots, flowers and berry counts across the block at those four stages. You'll see that between the flowering and pea size stage, the distribution of the flower and pea and berry counts per shoot remains relatively constant and it doesn't change that much prior to harvest with some exceptions where the berry diameter has an influence and the berry weight has an influence on the final yield. So we're seeing that we're actually able to determine the fruit set ratios for each of these bunches, simply by taking a photo before flowering and after fruit set. That's an essential tool for this yield prediction as well. So looking at each of those stages now, in this case, we used a simple quad bike with the GoPro cameras mounted on each side, driven through the vines. We then went and photographed the bunches, as you can see on the right hand side. And then we applied these algorithms. Specifically for flower counting, you can see here red dots representing flowers counted on that single inflorescence, or florets, I should call them. We tested this across 533 individual but inflorescences, which were manually stripped and counted. Don't ask how it was done, but a lot of tedious time and effort. This was tested across 12 different data sets. And in fact, we included a couple of additional cultivars for this comparison. Using 13 images for calibration, we were able to achieve an accuracy of 84% from a single image by image processing. That means that if you take a photo of an inflorescence in your block, one image will get you an accuracy of 84%. There is some variation with the maturity stage, but we found that the best stage is around EL18. And you can go plus or minus around two EL stages on the same cultivar without a dramatic decrease in accuracy. However, there is variation between cultivars and the accuracy goes down well below 80% when you have cultivars that are quite different in structure. Merlot in particular had a dramatically different accuracy if the algorithm was trained on a Shiraz or Cabernet variety. If however you calibrated for a Merlot specific set of images, your accuracy you can see there as the bottom column in the, in the uh, figure is still over 80%. So these on the right hand side, these accuracies ranging between 80 and 90% are for when the algorithm is trained for bunches within the same block and then used to extrapolate up to 50, 100 or more images within that same block. And these are all cross validated to give you an idea of the accuracy. For the machine learning approach for berry counting, we applied this and achieved an accuracy of over 90% in some cases and in all cases over 85% from a single image. Finally, 
the 3D reconstruction was applied to bunches close to harvest. And for a single bunch, the accuracy is around 88 to 90 percent. However, when that's applied across, let's say, 120 bunches photographed across an entire block, the accuracy improves markedly up to 98 percent in a couple of blocks. So you can see that taking more images clearly improves your accuracy. And this work has been published and there's more to come and more detail on it as well. So how did this all turn out in terms of overall yield estimation? You want the bottom line, what was the accuracy that we achieved? Looking at the first column in this table, the proposed method in year three achieved an accuracy of 20% or an error of 20% at the shoot stage, 5% at flowering, 14% and 12% at piece size and harvest respectively. This hasn't achieved what the winemakers would like apart from flowering stage, where we are very close to the goal of 5% accuracy. Now you're all sitting there thinking and going, why is the accuracy decreasing or the error increasing as we go from flowering closer to harvest? Well, remember that this approach is fundamentally based on the overall shoot counts early in the season. So while the shoot count estimate here for the final year is 20%, and although we're measuring now flowers and berries at the later stages, we're still fundamentally relying on the visual shoot count across the entire block. And we found that in two of our blocks, the number of shoots that were counted manually between the shoot stage and the harvest stage changed dramatically. In one case, we had a loss of 35, and another case, 39% in the number of shoots. You might wonder, where do they all go? Or was that manual validation very poorly done? We can't give an exact answer for why that was the accuracy achieved, but just note that the shoot counting underpins all of these methods and the accuracies obtained. However, what you will notice is that compared to the best practice stratified sampling manual estimates in the second column, the image processing method was always better. And in fact, the image processing method was able to get less than 1% error in a couple of individual instances. The only other caveat I'll note here is that within this project, we've relied on data from years one and two of the project in order to understand the average bunch weights, the average berry weights, the fruit set ratios, the shoot gain loss factors, and the bunch gain loss factors, and any berry gain or loss factors. So just relying on two years worth of prior data is quite a limitation, and something we'd look to improve in extending this study to further years. So what have we achieved? We've achieved an accuracy of 5% at flower counting. Sorry, an error of only 5% at flower counting. We've achieved improvements over the manual methods. One thing to note here is this is all relying purely on data within the project and nothing to do with farmer intuition. There is no prediction based on the weather. This is purely data driven. And we believe that improvements can be made using weather data, using uh, longer term histories of all of these measurements. But does yield est estimation actually make sense? Because instead of doing all of this manually, you'll actually find that if you didn't do any estimation at all, you didn't go out and spend any time collecting data, but you instead just relied on the long term average, you'd be out by 32%. So in some cases, and in fact, in 40% of the blocks that we did manual estimation, we were out by more than the long-term average. So in other words, why do yield estimation by manual methods? It's not reliable. It does not improve the accuracy. And in many cases, you would be better off just using your long-term average. So while manual estimation in itself does not work, we've shown that by image processing, we can generate more accurate methods, more accurate yield estimation overall. So to summarize all of those, if you use stratified sampling, that will give you a better, or that it, 30 samples are sufficient for obtaining an average measure 
or yield across the block. If you want to actually map the yield and build a variation map across the block, I haven't shown results here, but we've also calculated that you'll need more than 200 samples per block or else you won't be able to get the variation reliably. We didn't find particular trends in accuracy across different cultivars, sites and stage, with the exception of uh, pea size, where the bias is based on the selection of bunches in a manual sense. There was no particular component of yield that stood out, although berry diameter became more important closer to harvest. So you can throw away yield estimation by manual methods. You can just use a long-term average, but if you want to get better, then you need to start to use this technology. So what did we do that was actually novel and has ongoing benefits to industry? We've shown that shoot counting, existing methods for shoot counting developed by this group are able to give you accurate methods for generating maps of shoots across the block. And doing that around EL9 is proven to be the best stage to do it. We've introduced a method for flower counting by image processing. There have been existing apps, some of you may be aware of them, that do flower counting. We found they weren't suitable for Australian conditions and hence we've improved on their algorithms and we have algorithms that are able to now give you 84% accuracy from a single image and we can tell you the best stage there is EL16. We've shown methods that are able to count berries per bunch and use that as an input to the overall yield estimation system where the berry counting is over 90% accurate. These tools together can be used to reliably estimate fruit set ratios without any destructive samples. We've also shown that if you combine the shoot maps with the flower counts, you'll improve the accuracy over just doing manual counts of uh, the flowers or manual counts of the shoots. We know that we need to measure berry diameter. We've shown that expensive camera systems are not particularly useful and not particularly reliable for use in the field. And so we would recommend simpler solutions. We would strongly advocate going towards either GoPro or similar style video cameras. It may even be mobile phones on a mobile platform or even farmers using mobile phones for static imagery as well. We've also shown that counting inflorescences in spur prune blocks is infeasible. What else have we learned? that consistency in data collection is critical. It is very rare to find a company or a grower that has long-term records of all of the yield components. Or what happens if their vineyard manager is hit by a bus? Where do you get that data from? Consistency of data collection and consistency of storage is absolutely critical. We have developed in this a databasing system that is able to manage these records. However, more work is needed to use this kind of system across the industry. There's bias everywhere. So taking human measurement out of the loop is critical. Being able to transfer data is also very important. And we were very thankful to have the NBN applied on both of the sites where in the middle of the project, in fact, and that dramatically improved our feedback times and help to the farmers. Otherwise, we were mailing hard drives around the country. We also found that harvester efficiency needs improvement or else you're just losing fruit. So I need to recognize, as I've mentioned throughout contributions by some team members that were done in parallel to this project. And we're very thankful for the input of those towards the results that were generated. What then do we recommend? We need to do longer term data collection to build the prediction factors. We need to turn these learnings and the algorithms into a cloud-based system for the yield calculation, whether it relies on cloud-based image processing or whether it relies on manual image processing, we can still test both, but we need ways for consistently collecting and managing the data. We need to train the industry to improve methods for data management right through from collection to, to usage at the other end. This is absolutely critical. We can't go on and improve the estimation if we can't get reliable data. And that starts with everyone. Everyone listening is responsible for that. We believe that fully automating early season video data collection 
would also provide a very useful tool. So this is the Shute County in particular. We'd love to be able to extend Scarlett's work to be fully automated where you put a camera on a tractor and it will come back with a map. We're a very long way towards doing that, but we need your help to continue to make that fully automated and easy for farmers. We'd love to be able to take them on and continue to commercialize them and build those final maps. We also believe that a critical factor for visibility of inflorescences, bunches, but particularly shoots and inflorescences would be the greater adoption of cane prune systems. We've seen these on a number of uh, properties where we've been, and we note that they provide much better access to the fruit so we can get better, more reliable systems for image processing and counting. Given that there already exist flower counting apps, we'd love to extend that and develop an Australian based flower counting app for doing that within the block, as well as extending that to 3D reconstruction, very diameter measurement, potentially in one or in multiple apps. So extending the testing, developing cloud-based systems are where we believe the future lies from this project. There are also other options that our group is investigating, such as reconstructing the ruckus for phenotyping, non-contact bunch maturity measurement, and automating the data collection using UAVs or ground vehicles. That concludes the presentation today. I note there are a couple of questions that are coming out, uh, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to many people who've contributed to this project. It has been enormous uh, group work. And we also thank Wine Australia for providing the funding, Treasury Wines and Seesaw Wines for providing access to the block. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, we do have some questions, um, but if there are some other people wanting to ask questions, you can, um, to ask the question, click on the Q&A button and type your question into the text box. Now, the first questions I think we'll deal with are from Andrew. And I think the first one is a bit of a statement. It says, knowing the number of shoots per block and then the number of flowers per shoot is crucial. And he then asks, what was the means of producing the berry weight that populates the bunch weight? Okay, so as Andrew said, knowing the number of shoots per block and then the number of flowers per shoot is critical as we've shown from our year three method and results. That's why we can get the 5% accuracy if we can measure those individual florets prior to flowering in the block and then scale it up using a measure of shoots across the entire block. For the second question in terms of producing the berry weight to populate the bunch weight, the berry weights that we've used here have, or the predicted berry weights have been based on the prior two years manual measurement of berry weights. Uh, in some cases we've done this by individual berries, but it's proved to be more reliable to take a bunch, count the number of berries and uh, weigh the entire bunch and subtract the ruckus weight. So a historical measure has been used to produce the berry weight. That said, and in fact, I do have a uh, following slide I might go to just to show you a quick relationship. Uh, if you look at this slide here between berry diameter and weight, on the right hand side is a graph that shows you the relationship between diameter and weight, and it is very close to linear. Um, you can see here. So if you can take a photo of the bunch, then it's quite feasible in order to be able to uh, determine the berry diameter and also to be able to determine the berry weight in answer to that question. Okay, Andrew also asks another question. Where are we at with commercializing this sort of technology or at least getting some of the apps out there to other industry bodies so that we can use them in our own vineyards? Look, I think we're right there. For the apps specifically, we have proof of concepts that work. In fact, we have proof of concept apps that are able to do some of the aspects here, the berry counting in particular. The flower counting is something that simply needs to be implemented on an app basis. So 
this is where people need to say, look, there's a value in it, where we need you as growers and the audience to say, look, we absolutely need these things, then we can go ahead and, and take them forward. So I think potential's there and uh, we just need to go and do it now. Uh, just to look through the other questions then. Um, the question about flower counting using image processing. Uh, why would it be different uh, between varieties when it's counting the flower irrelevant of the variety? The answer to that is different varieties have different occlusion factors. So some bunches are quite tight and dense and the difference between determining what's hidden behind uh, florets on the top versus on the bottom of the uh, single photo or from when viewed from a single image can be quite different. Um, we do our best at determining the ac at detecting the individual florets, but there are many that are hidden. There are many that are on the side or angles, but that's the reason for the substantial variety be difference between different varieties. Uh, another question from Andrew was, what sort of harvester driver care factors were important to improve the harvester improvements? Uh, I think someone that it might be more along the lines of someone who's been heavily invested and worked in the vineyard was more uh, careful at driving than, a, than an external contractor. Uh, but on the orange blocks in particular, care was taken to train the shoots away from the posts. So a lot of the fruit that remains on the vines was close to the posts. Uh, and we found that uh, in the orange blocks in particular, training the shoot away from the posts has improved that. Um, and that's one of the um, factors you can do to improve the harvester efficiency. Uh, another question around the flower count includes accounting for the other side of the bunch. Yes, I've, I guess I've answered that in, in a sense that when we talk about the accuracy for the flower counting, we're talking about accuracy here from the image to the final number manually ver verified. So we're not talking about just visible flowers, we're talking about um, what's hidden as well. And in fact, um, I can go back through a number of slides to show you from the flower counting, uh, an example image just here. You can see that quite a number of the flowers uh, in that image have been hidden, or there's a lot detected. So the algorithm does allow for um, estimating those hidden ones. We've actually got a paper uh, that's under review at the moment that looks at different ways of estimating those hidden flowers, um, and a simple linear factor was able to count for them um, quite quite reasonably. A following question was in terms of um, uh, frost events. Um, yes, of course, frost does influence the yields, and one of the initial um, when we showed the overall uh, yields for blocks, one of the data points was missing. That was due to a dramatic frost event. Uh, so yes, that would be important. Depending on when the frost occurs. So if you do your shoot counting at a stage after uh, the likelihood of frost events, then you're going to have a fairly good estimate of what fruit is there. If you do the um, shoot counting prior to frost events, depending on your region, then yes, you're going to have to have some measure of what's there, of what amount of fruit has been influenced by the frost. That said, I guess there's potential to go through the block with the GoPros after substantial frost events and determine the amount of um, influenced or dead um, shoots or, or leaves throughout the block. And that would also be used as an input to, to influence the final yield um, estimation. Um, there's some comments here rather than questions, just going through here. Um, a comment about shoot thinning in terms of the vines. Um, no shoot thinning or bunch thinning was done um, in any of these blocks throughout, throughout the, the trial period. Uh, so yeah, we can look at how that influences the variability, but there was no shoot thinning done on any of these blocks as far as I'm aware. Um, so yeah, there's comments around cane pruning. Yes, it's more expensive, uh, but you do have um, accuracy in terms of 
uh, what's visible in terms of fruit. Uh, and I think it's a long-term solution that needs to be carefully uh, considered. Uh, another question around uh, counting shoots at EL12 and the inflorescences are clearly shown and later developing shoots. Um, so the issue with doing it around EL12 is that you get very close to a point where the shoots start to overlap. So although the algorithm that Scarlett has developed is able to account for substantially overlapping shoots, when it gets too dense, then there is no practical way to um, split them out. So beyond EL12, it's basically impractical to do shoot counting. Um, depends on what you say by inflorescences clearly shown. For the blocks that we have at EL stage, the inflorescences are, are definitely not clearly visible. Um, and that may be just to the uh, spur pruning arrangement, and maybe due to the density of shoots that are used on these particular blocks. Um, look, we'd love to, to say that counting the inflorescences by the video um, would be better, but we've found that it hasn't been practical um, so far. There's a question then in terms of um, final yield. No, disease hasn't been used because we're assuming here that we're counting the shoots throughout the entire block. If there is disease, then one of that, that will impact on the bunches that you go through and photograph later. So if the disease is consistent throughout the block, then yes, this will be accounted for in the final yield, but no, otherwise disease is not being uh, considered. If there's disease prevalent throughout the entire block, affecting things relatively uniformly. I know that's going to be quite rare, but if it was, then we'll see that in the overall berry counts and berry diameters. Um, question in terms of current, current um, status of funding for ongoing work. Uh, that's open to uh, whether Wine Australia is interested in continuing and whether uh, other partners are interested in continuing to develop this. So there's um, enormous potential. Um, we've seen around um, access to IP. So some of these things, aspects, particularly the 3D reconstruction and initial parts of the shoot counting um, are separate IP to this project, but there's options there to continue to bring them in and develop further beyond the end of this um, project. A further question for uh, shoot thinning uh, prior to flowering. I think I've commented on this before, uh, beyond EL12 it's getting um, quite difficult, but, or at least when the shoots are starting to overlap, um, it's very difficult to do any kind of uh, image processing once the shoots start to overlap um, in your particular blocks. So uh, a final question then, or a second last question, um, in terms of uh, app-based tools. So what we have at the moment and what you've seen for the image processing has been based on not apps, but offline algorithms that are doing the processing. What we've tested though and done as initial app development can either work online or in the cloud. Uh, both are possible and as you mentioned, network availability is an issue, um, but both approaches are feasible. Uh, we just haven't implemented them for all of the systems you've seen developed here. But yes, they're both possible and we'd love to continue development of those further uh, beyond the end of this project. Uh, another question in terms of uh, stratified sampling approach, uh, perhaps we can use less than 30 zones. Uh, that would be that would be great. Um, we've all, but again, as you've said, the stratified sampling um, does, does improve. Um, then yes, we can look at improving that. But just to note that the stratified sampling does improve things as a, as a result. Um, and a final question then at the moment, and please throw some more up if you'd like. Uh, what are we using for image processing? Uh, for the majority of this has been done uh, within MATLAB for the uh, image processing. We've also implemented some of these techniques using OpenCV, but predominantly as this is a research project, we've done it in MATLAB uh, for the work within this particular project. Are there any further questions?
Well, that looks like it's all the questions now. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. And I'll just move to... Right. So thank you very much, Mark. Now we'll wrap up the session. And thank you to everyone for participating participating so enthusiastically in today's session. All the attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. The next AWRI webinar is on the 7th of December when Darren Ray, a senior meteorologist at BOM, will provide a seasonable outlook for vintage 2018. If you would like to register for this session, please visit the AWRI website. That's all we have today, and thank you again for attending, and I look forward to seeing you again at the next AWRI webinar.